Yeah. Um, so, I guess in terms of announcements, the only thing I have to say is that I'm working on grading the first assignment. It's going really slowly, but hopefully, I can come back sooner rather than later. Um, and also thinking about writing the second assignment. Yeah, I'm happy to share what I have. All right. Um, so, um, will you be the voice? If that's, I believe, the correct pronunciation. I thought you heard Du Bois, but I think he's on record saying that it's pronounced. <laughs> That's how you spell. <laughs> I think that means voice. <laughs> All right. Um, and live uh, lived a pretty long life. Um, he died three years before I was born in his 90s. Um, so, uh, but the two things we're reading by him are from 1901 and 1920. So he did uh, write a lot more stuff after that. He uh, changed his mind in various ways, I guess, but um, uh, I don't know if I can say I have a really, I mean, the first thing, the reading for today sold the flag post, which is his most famous book. So you definitely would read that. But as far as what to read from later, I think it's not, you know, 100% clear what the best thing would be, but um, certainly seems like the essays in Dark Water are, are pretty interesting and interestingly different from Soul of Black. Um, and uh, maybe I should move this camera. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so he was born, as you can see, after the end of the Civil War. After, so after the end of slavery, he was born in Massachusetts. Um, and um, his parents were also born free, I think both of them in Massachusetts also. And in, in fact, at least uh, in some branches of his family, they had been free for several generations. Um, so when he writes about slavery and its aftermath, as he does a lot, um, especially in this book, he's writing to some extent as an outsider, right? He's from the North. He's from a free Black family, again, for several generations. Um, and um, and to some extent as a sociologist, which among other things he was, it, that was his academic discipline. Um, on the other hand, of course, when he's writing about, um, so he, I mean, he did live in the South for many years and taught at Atlanta University in Atlanta, obviously. Um, uh, so, you know, when he writes about um, Jim Crow in the South or about racial prejudice in the North or the South, you know, in that case, he's writing from bitter experience. Um, and moreover, I guess, I mean, he says this, um, but um, but it's, it's worth remembering this because I think it's easy to forget that um, in those respects, things actually grew visibly worse through most of his lifetime. Hey, like things were getting worse. Like, for example, um, Harvard, which was among the places he went to, like one of his alma maters, or whatever the color of the mater is, right? Um, bans blacks from the dorms in 1921. 
Uh -huh. So, I mean, a long time after he had gone there, right? So, like, imagine finding that out at the place that you went to school and now banned. Like, if you went there now, you wouldn't be allowed to live in the dorms. Um, so, um, anyway, that's that was kind of a digression from talking about, like, what, you know, the sort of course of his life. Um, he, he, in Massachusetts as a child, he uh, attended integrated schools, actually. So he had white classmates. Um, and, um, but then he went on to graduate from Fisk University in Nashville, which was a black, is a historically black university in Nashville. Um, and then he went to Harvard and he got a second PA from Harvard. I think, I think because, uh, okay, I think, as usual, a lot of my information comes from the Wikipedia page, although not all of it, <laughs> most of it, I don't know. But so anyway, apparently it's because Harvard wouldn't accept the credit from Fisk, so he just had to start over again. He got a BA from Harvard, and eventually he got a PhD from Harvard in 1895. Um, and you know, in between, he also studied in in Germany. Um, so uh, that is as, that is as part of his graduate studies, he went to Germany and studied for a while. He came back, he got his PhD in eighteen ninety five, um, and his PhD was in sociology. Um, I believe his BA was in history. PhD was in sociology. So. Um, Um, he knew Jane Adams, as I mentioned when I talked about Jane Adams. Um, he also knew Dewey, who we're going to be reading next. He studied with William James, who we're not reading, but maybe we should be reading. But anyway, he studied with, studied with William James while he was at Harvard. Um, um, when he was in Germany, he got to know, know Max Weber. Um, who also maybe, even though he was not an American philosopher, would be read in some version of this course. <laughs> um, and uh, and I guess he probably must have met Royce since the, the times they were at Harvard overlapped. But I don't know, I didn't find anything about interaction between him and Royce. Um, and so then after he got his PhD, he worked as an academic for about 15 years. Um, most of the time at Atlanta University, as I said, in Georgia. Um, and he, um, he taught at Atlanta University again later from 1933 to 1943. In between, he was um, for many years the editor of the NAACP's magazine, The Crisis. And in fact, like a lot of the essays in Dark Water, the second book we're reading stuff from, were first published in the crisis. Um, so, uh, although we also published in other places like the Atlantic and whatever. Um, he was actually participated in the founding of the NAACP, although the NAACP was, was Started by a group that included a lot of whites, and they're like the um, most of the top officers were white for many years. Actually. But I mean, he but uh, he was he was the editor of the magazine, and I'll, and I also believe that a director of research and publicity or something like that. Um, and the other thing that uh, well, actually, there's two other things I wanted to say. What one is that I mean, we'll be seeing this more next time. I think this. I don't know if he really changed his mind about this, or if it just came out more strongly in his writing. But it, it, but in any case, um, especially in the essays for next time, we'll see how strongly he attracted he was to socialism. Um, and he had at least, he had a complicated relationship with Marxism, I think. Um, um, but, uh, 
of course, not attracted to anodes. Um, so, I mean, anarchism uh, is basically like after having seen the most explicit form of it in Declare, it's kind of now going to drop back into the background. People, are, you know, um, don't take it seriously as a possibility. Um, or they see it as a, a terrifying possibility, I guess. Um, so, um, and the other thing I wanted to say is, at, so at the end of his life, um, and I think there's a like somewhat complicated story behind this, but he, but at the end of his life, he ended up renouncing his American citizenship and moving to Ghana in his 90s. <laughs> Um, or late 80s, anyway. Um, so, um, that's always uh, cast a certain sh shadow backward over all the things he's writing. I think that, like, in the end, he, he, he felt that he, he just couldn't continue to try to be an American when he moved to, to Ghana, um, which was one of the Ghana was one of the earliest. Colonies in Africa gave him independence. And then the president, Kwame Nkrumah, was um, like an important African intellectual philosopher, whatever. Once he was in power, he ended up being a, a dictator. <laughs> I'm not sure how, like, I'm not sure how aware the voice was of that or what he thought about it. Um, all right. Um, so, um, and you know, I think there's other important things about him that you can tell from reading his works, like, for example, that he wrote poetry. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so, the reading for this time is, I mean, there's there's two parts of it. Oh, you know what? And I forgot to print this out. But I think I have whatever quotes I'm going to read in my notes anyway. But, right, the reading for this time actually had two parts. One was this really early essay called Conservation of Racism. But I think that was from 1896 or something. Yeah, 1896. And then most of the rest of it is from, as I said, his most famous book, but also his first popular book. Before that, he published a study called uh, The Philadelphia Negro, a sociological study, I guess kind of pioneering sociological study. Um, but um, but his first popular book was this one, The Soul of the Black Book, which, oh, I thought it was 1901, but 1903, I guess. This is 1896. Um, and I assigned this for um, for several reasons, one is just to see uh, how positive Du Bois starts out about Europe. Um, I mean, we'll we'll see that in Dark Water, his relationship to Europe. Well, I mean, it's it's very conflicted. I guess. <laughs> At this stage, he seems to have nothing but good things to say about Europe. Um, there was another um, early essay, I was, or I think it was a, actually a speech he gave um, called uh, The Spirit of Modern Europe, something like that, where he basically is like reporting to a, an audience of Blacks in the South about his travels through Europe. And it's like about, you know, um, these kind of uh, flowery descriptions of various great European cities, like Budapest, 
Paris. So that <laughs> one then. Um, so, but in the, but in this one, it's not just that he's positive about it, but also like it's uh, I guess you would say Eurocentric. Right? He says there have been eight great races of mankind, but it turns out four of them are different kinds of Europeans. <laughs> it's like the, I don't know, there's like the Teutonic race and the British race and the Latin race. You know, I, I forget what they are, but, and then, you know, after he lists the eight great races, he also says there are some other minor race groups, such as American Indians. <laughs> Which um, is um, weird, right? That there would be four races in Europe. Right? <laughs> Remember what the world looks like. Like, yeah. This is Europe, and this is America. <laughs> and in here, there are four races, and in here, there's like a minor race that's like a blip at it. <laughs> and it, you know, just happened to have built kind of to be blonde. And I mean, like it's it's a weird perspective. It's a very it's very much a European perspective. Um, um to some extent, um Especially that thing about the American Indians being kind of a footnote. Um, it kind of continues later too. And I'm not sure how to explain it, although I might have something to say about it. Um, but anyway, he also, so now of course, what like one of the great races is the black or Negro race. Um, I take it it's, I, I think you understand that that like Negro was the word to use at this, or was one of the like polite words to use at this time. I you know I'm not going to try to change them all to something else. Or, right. So um, so and he he but he completely seems to accept that the Negro race is behind all the others, and that like Africa. Except for Egypt, although even that, it's you know, it only comes out sometimes that he that, that he counts Egypt as an African civilization. But it's, but like after that, he um, accepts that Africa has yet to produce great civilization. Um, in in this essay, right? So uh, you know. Um, um, and this is still true in the souls of black folk, actually. So I have here, but so I, I'm going to give the page numbers in in the one I linked to. I I just this is what I happen to have this like cheesy three great American <laughs> African American author. So what I happen to have in my house already. So I'm going to I'm going to read from that, but I'll tell you the numbers in yours. So um, so this is page uh, one six. No, wait. Oh, it's page three. It's page 168 in mine. Um, and it's in the essay called Of Our Spiritual Thrivings. After the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Teuton and Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son. By the way, I assume Indian there means Indian from India. I think so. So it's Egyptian, Indian, Greek, Roman, Teuton, that is German, Mongolian, that is Asian, or like East Asian. The Negro is a sort of seventh son. Um, right, like the Negro race is, is still like um, trying to achieve trying to define its goal in this world and trying to achieve it. This, I think, is something that does change later, right? I mean, he starts to say more and more that um, history has been written 
by Europeans and that they had just neglected the, whatever happened in Africa or something like that. But, um, but at this stage, it's actually um, important that he thinks that because as he says, I mean, he's, I think he, he says this in the Soul of the Black Folk too, but in the Conservation of Races essay um, on page 56, he talks about the duty of American Blacks to serve as, quote, the advance guard of the Negro people. Right, meaning that the um, um, that the American blacks who have been in contact with European civilization in this intimate way are going to lead the way forward for the um, people who are still in Africa. Um, So, um, right, so that was one of the reasons I assigned this, because I wanted to, you know, I wanted to show how, like, early on, how, in a way, very Eurocentric he was. Um, um, but another thing that's interesting in this essay is that um, it becomes clear um, how much from the beginning the idea of race um, and so like he is not a thinker who is against the concept of race. I mean, you can certainly tell that here, right? I mean, he says the history of the world is a history of races. Um, he's not a thinker who thinks that that's a bad concept. Um, uh, and moreover, he, like, why, what, one reason you might think it's a bad concept is that people should be treated as individuals. And, in in this essay, he says like explicitly, um, which I mean, and this shouldn't be surprising given the stuff we've just been reading from Adams and Royce, especially, who, who you know are like um, in the same circles with him to, to some extent. That he's he says, well, you know. Um, yeah, it's hard for us to understand the the historical and sociological truth that the history of the world is the history of races because we're too individuals. Right, so like this is on page 53. Um, we who have been reared and trained under the individ individualistic philosophy of the Declaration of Independence and the laissez-faire philosophy of Adam Smith are loath to see and loath to acknowledge this patent fact of human history. Um, right, so he's saying, you know, he, he's connecting himself with the idea that the individual, um, the freedom of individuals, you know, is um, connected with their is like presupposes their connection with some larger cause. Um, but he's saying that the that uh, yeah, I mean, like of course he doesn't think that this is the only kind of cause, but uh, but um, but the important one, the one that history about is about, is these things he's calling racists. And, you know, I mean, he talks in this, like, he doesn't mean it in a purely biological sense, although, he, you know, he thinks that physical characteristics often go along with this, but it does, you know, it's it's a little bit complicated, but, um, and of course, he doesn't think that one of the races is superior to the other. Um, but he does think they have, like, different missions. Different 
spiritual characteristics. Um, and um, interestingly, um, as in Royce, the Japanese are cited as a model. Race, this is also on page 56 in the Conservation of Race essay. It says, you know, just this part's not a quote, but just as the Japanese have to have to work together, inspired by the Japanese ideal, quote, for the development of Negro genius, of Negro literature and art, of Negro spirit, only Negroes bound and welded together, Negroes inspired by one vast ideal can work out in its fullness that great message we have for humanity. Right, so the, the idea is, you know, um, just as there's some kind of unifying ideal of Japan and the Japanese all are working together to realize it and bring its message to humanity, that's the same thing we have to do. Um, you know, uh, Japan, obviously, I think Japan actually continued to, to play a role in his thought even much later in his life. Japan obviously was a, you know, um, model of a non-white uh, nation that, like, um, asserted itself, maintained its independence, had its own traditions and ideals that it was trying to fulfill, um, uh, beat Russia in the war, um, and eventually, like, in the, um, in World War II, Du Bois was actually opposed to the war in the Pacific, because he thought that, um, Japan was like a important anti-imperialist force. Um, what about Japanese imperialism? Well, like he visited Manchuria and, and reported that Japanese imperialism wasn't bad like European imperialism. So, you know, like he was, I think, I mean, this is only this is only one example of a several like that. Maybe the thing about Kwame Nkrumah in, in Ghana is also an example. Um, in you know, uh, he visited Germany in 1936, which right, you know, what was happening in Germany in 1936, and um, he said he was greeted warmly and like. Um, he, you know, to his credit, he said what the Nazis are doing to the Jews is horrible. It's a crime against civilization, whatever. But he said, but there's some good part things about them too. <laughs> so, um, right. So, you know, I guess you could say, and I mean, the same thing, like he visited the Soviet Union at some point and came back, like, really excited about what was going on there um, at a time, well, was it? May have been before Stalin, but still. So, like, I guess you could say, you know, he was a little bit naive. I mean, the same thing happened in American politics. He endorsed Woodrow Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, because Woodrow Wilson promised to, like, when he was a candidate, promised to fight discrimination against blacks or whatever. Once he was in office, he stepped up discrimination against blacks in federal uh, hiring and whatever. Um, so, yeah, you could say he was a little bit naive about things like this. Um, probably I am too. Right? <laughs> and, if, and the nature of things, I don't know what things I'm naive about are, but <laughs> it's, it's like probably a professional hazard, right? You know. <laughs> so, but in any case, why was I talking about all that? Uh, because. Um, Oh, because of what he said about the Japanese in Manchuria. Right. So anyway, um, but uh, but I think, as I said, it's probably um, beyond that. It's probably not a coincidence that, that the Japanese figure in his discussion and in Royce, because um, they're also just supposed to be an example of society that is um, like 
I don't know, run through with discipline and self-sacrifice and loyalty, and yet not um, uh, passive, uh, you know, lacking in individual initiative, whatever, right? Like that's supposed to be a uh, problem, but the Japanese have solved to some extent. And that's also, I think, what he's gesturing towards. Um, okay. So that's like, I might come back and say some things about individual passages, but I, I think that's what I want to say about this essay. Are there questions about it? Is that anything I can say? Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about this book. Now, like, I mean, it's definitely worth reading the whole book. <laughs> um, I only assign parts of it because I can only expect so much reading. Um, and well, also, so. Well, okay, I'll start talking about what's in it, and then I might explain why some things were better for this course than others. But um, so, like, on the one hand, this is definitely an American book. Um, so, like, on page in the fourth thought, on page Roman numeral seven. When he says that um, this book is about the meaning of being black here in the dawning of the 20th century. Here means in America. <laughs> I think that's that's pretty clear. Um, but you know that here, is like, it's not just a random place. I think in, in Du Bois's mind, um, um, and for all the reasons we've been already been talking about, America is like, in some sense, it's a universal place. It's the most important place. It's like, it's like the world historical place. Right, I think that, again, that's that that has something to do with his idea that the American blacks are going to be the the moving force behind the the Af the African people in general um, achieving their greatness because the American blacks are in America and America is like um, somehow significant. Um, which, I mean, clearly, if you've done the reading, you know that doesn't mean you think everything is going great in America or anything like that. But that, you know, but that also, that, that's the thing, that makes it, that makes those problems significant that they're happening here. It makes them worse problems if they're happening here, even, I think, I would say. Okay, so it's definitely a book about America. I guess the other question would be, is it a book of philosophy? Because this course is supposed to be, as right two words in the title, it's supposed to be American philosophy. And I think, um, so there at first you might think the answer is less clear. I mean, for one thing, just as I said about Adams, I don't think that Du Bois really identified himself as a philosopher. Um, as I said, academically, his field for history and sociology. Um, and yet, this book is not really a history or sociology book, although there's a lot of history and sociology in it. <laughs> um, and you know, so what I was gonna what I was gonna say before is like the parts of it that are most clearly of that nature are among the parts I didn't assign. 
although they're very important and worth reading, right? So this, um, um, after our spiritual striving, which is kind of the introductory essay, there's a long essay of the dawn of freedom, which is about what happened um, in the South, at, you know, after emancipation. And it's a very detailed history of what happened. Um, so, and similarly, some of the other chapters, um, um, but especially this chapter seven of the Black Belt is like, a, you know, sociological description, basically, of Blacks living in the Black Belt in the South. I don't know exactly what the definition of the Black Belt is. <laughs> Uh, so, um, um, so there is there there is plenty of history and sociology in the book. Um, there's also a lot of other things in it. Autobiography. There's a lot of autobiography in it. Um, there's. Um, um, Political polemic, basically uh, um, against uh, Booker T. Washington. Um, so Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington is also in my in my choosing three great American uh, African American classics book. Um, Ray Booker T. Washington had you know. Um, brokered a kind of compromise according to which Blacks wouldn't try to get the vote or insist on civil rights in the South. And like in, retain, in return, they'd be able to set up their own education system. And he emphasized that the education system should be industrial training, that higher education was like not practical. Um, so uh, um, Du Bois is, oh, it's a tricky situation because Booker T. Washington is the like most visible and popular black leader in the country. And Du Bois thinks that he has actually accomplished a lot of good things, but of course he's very upset about the terms of that compromise. So, you know, so that's another thing that there's a lot of in various parts of the book, um, mostly in parts I didn't assign. But um, okay, so all that stuff is going on. But on the other hand, there's something about something in this book about the world. Um, and about another world outside the world. Right, so those two worlds are what in the fourth lot he calls, um, and, after, and continues to call after that, the world within and without the veil. Right, so there's a veil. The veil separates the world from the other world. Usually, the black world is within the veil, so like inside of the black world. This is the veil, and outside is. So you could call this the white world, but he usually calls it the world, <laughs> right? Or the world without the veil. Um, you know, because as he says, when he describes his own recognition of this situation as a child and then later growing up, that he realized that he couldn't afford to just um, um, like look with contempt on the people out here. He said that was his original reaction. 
But he said he couldn't afford to because they had all the things he wanted out there. <laughs> um, like a PhD from Harvard, right? So, um, and well, I mean, but it's, it's not so much the degree he wanted, I guess, although I assume he wanted the degree. I mean, you can't get a PhD unless you want it. <laughs> so, but I mean, you know, but like the opportunity for education that that represents. So, um, um, right. So, like in some sense, this is this is like the real world or where the real action is, and this is where you're like trapped inside another world. Sometimes he's, he, sometimes the geometry seems to be the reverse, and he talks about the black world being beyond the veil. Makes it sound like it's outside. But in any case, um, that so so there are these two worlds, and then he says, so this is on page one in so it's at the very beginning of our spiritual thrivings. By the way, so like at the beginning of each chapter, well, at the beginning of each, cha each chapter, first there's some like poetry that he quotes, mostly white poets. Um, and then there's like a phrase of music, which is from a, you know, like black spiritual, um, I guess we'll call that genre now. Um, uh, I don't know how to read music, so, but um, the LibriVox, there's a LibriVox recording of this book. And the person who recorded it actually did an amazing job. And, but among other things, they played all these um, little phrases. So if you want to hear what they are, you can, you can find that. LibriVox.com. No, LibriVox.org. Um, so in any case, um, Right, so I was going to read from the beginning. This is the very beginning of the first essay. So it's after the forethought, but it's the beginning of the official part of the book. Between me and the other world, there is ever an unasked question. So between me and the other world, I think, first of all, you might think that meant he's talking about the veil. Um, so like I'm in here and between me and the other world is this, but I don't think that's what he means because the veil is not an unasked question, whatever it is. I think he means between me and the other world, even when I'm in the other world, outside of it, there's this unasked question. So later on at the end of the course, we're going to read a book called Between the World and Me. Um, and so note in the title, right, Honey's Coats, note in the title of that book, there's only one world, number one. Um, but um, that book also does open with an unasked question. So I, I think actually, even though in between the world, world and me, Coates gives actually two different like hints as to why the book is called that. There's like a there's like a poem, a quote from a poem at the beginning, which uses that phrase between the world and me. And then Coates uses it himself, like towards the end of the book. Um, but I also think he's thinking about this. Okay, so anyway, getting back to voice, so there's like a, um, so there's a world and a world beyond the world, and between me and the world is an unasked question. Um, these are like philosophical themes, basically. Um, Um, 
you might even see that say that this situation is Cartesian. I'm separated from the world by an unasked question. Um, well, I say unasked question because, like, um, The world doesn't speak to me. Um, it's um, um, it reads like an evil deceiver, right? not speaking to me, but. Um, uh, testing my will somehow. So, yeah. This is me unasked question like the beginning talks about like, people always, people never ask, you know, why are you? Probably doesn't mean that question. No, I think he does mean that question, but I'm trying to say that that, that I mean, that question, how does it feel to be a problem? Yeah. <laughs> is also, you know, like in other words, if I told you uh, that we were talking about Heidegger and that Heidegger starts out by saying between the subject and the world is an unasked question. What does it feel like to be a problem? <laughs> I think you would believe me, right? Like that's something Heidegger might say. Well, I don't know what that, but <laughs> right. So like, you know, and you, you can imagine him connecting problems or like thrown and projected, and, you know, whatever, right? So projecting, <laughs> right? So like these are, I mean, if you if you didn't know the context and I told you someone's writing a book about the world and and the world beyond the world and what's between me and the world and what's between me and the world is a question that's unasked but somehow addressed to me like what does it feel like to be a problem <laughs> um I think um you would believe that you know we're talking about existentialism. So um so so this suggests, I mean, maybe it only suggests to someone with an overactive interpreter imagination like me. I mean, but to me it suggests that this this veil has like it has. Um, it stands for something of like metaphysical significance. The Du Bois. Um, it's, I mean, it's not, uh, not that it isn't about like what happens to him when he, um, needs to ride on a train or wants to buy tickets to the movies or whatever. It is about that, but um, but he's understanding that as a philosophical problem. Um, and um, what kind of problem is it? Well, so, um, So the so as you already pointed out, the, the the unasked question is what does it feel like to be a problem? And um and then he says um so this is on page two in your edition. And yet being a problem is a strange experience peculiar even for one who has never been anything else, save perhaps, and both of these exceptions are, I think are important, but I'm gonna focus more on the second one now, save perhaps in babyhood and in Europe. <laughs> when he was in Europe, he wasn't a problem, perhaps. So he's, where is he a problem? He's a problem in America.
Now, so why is it that one has this experience, that he has this experience in America and not in Europe? So, I mean, there's a lot of possible answers to that. One possible answer would be, um, um, the, the simplest possible answer would be, oh, well, in Europe, people aren't prejudiced against blacks. And so, you know, they, they have no problem when they're pointing to it. Um, is that really plausible given the history of European colonialism? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, The problem is that I think Europe just has less, has a very a much smaller black population, but it doesn't mean that they're like less racist. I mean, you can see a lot of the dialogue that's happening around like specifically refugees, like Syria and Libya and all these places. And yeah, it's a discussion. I, I don't know if Europe now is, is like the best. Um, although, I mean, actually, the truth is. Well, there's a statement very much like this, or not a statement, there's a, there's a story very much like this in Coates, where he talks about his travels to France and his living in France. Um, where, again, like somehow he felt like he was a normal person. Um, so, like, I don't, um, I mean, it's more complicated than that, but I think that's, you could boil it the moral down for that for these purposes. So, um, um, and yet, I think, I mean, you're right about contemporary Europe. It's not like there's no racism there, but it's probably even more clearly true of early 20th century Europe. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, um, so there's, there's a difference in the way Du Bois is treated, I think, well, I mean, we're going to talk more about this next time, basically, um, because he's going to at in the beginning of Dark Water, he says a lot of really negative things about Hillary. Um, but then towards the end, he, he seems to come back and, and and say something like this about Europe. So like that's a place where you really have to reconcile. Here, I mean, you could say, although this wouldn't be very charitable, but he's just not thinking about it. Um, right, that he's just not thinking that these same people who are treating him well in Europe are at the same time trying to, you know, exploit black people in Africa and, like, based on racist ideology. Um, but I feel like it's not so much that he's not aware of that as that that's not the fundamental explanation for why he's not a problem in Europe. It's not that there, um, there's no race prejudice in Europe, but um, in Europe, there's no problem about that. I mean, whether this is a fair thing to say about France or not, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. France has its own, you know, like France also is a country that sometimes looks at itself as having a universal mission. <laughs> right. Um, but in a rather different way than America. Um, but in any case, I mean, um, I think well, um, let me just read. So this is towards the end of um, of our spiritual strivings. It's on page twelve in your text. Um, Merely a concrete test of the underlying principles of the Great Republic is the Negro problem. Maybe I should read the rest of that sentence too. Merely a concrete test of the underlying principles of the Great Republic is the Negro problem. 
and the spiritual striving of the freedmen's sons is a travail of souls whose burden is almost beyond the measure of their strength, but who bear it in the name of an historic race, in the name of this land of their father's fathers, and in the name of human opportunity. Right, so in America, that's the great republic, right? It has its underlying principles. This is the same thing Martin Hughes said about America, right? That it was, it, um, it showed that it's false, that you, that, that you can't found a constitution on principles. The principles of the Declaration of, that stated in the Declaration of Independence um, are the underlying principles of the great republic and the Negro problem is a concrete test of those principles. And the black people who are trying to um, um, overcome that problem are doing it so, like, on the one hand, he says they're doing it in the name of a historic race, right? So, again, that's back to the idea that the Negro race as a whole needs what the Black people in America are doing. And he also says they're doing it on behalf of the land of their fathers and their father's fathers. That is, they're doing it on behalf of America. And thirdly, they're doing it in the name of human opportunity. Right, like because America is a, is a um, has this universal significance. What happens here? Whether the Great Republic can can solve its problem and um, overcome this test of its underlying principles is a question for humanity as a whole. And so, like I said, I think the point is that um, in Europe, um, you may meet someone who's racist or you may meet someone who's not. And um, um, uh, either way, there's no unasked question hanging there. Right, so like what Du Bois says often, I don't remember if there's any of this in this reading or not, but what he says often about his experience in Europe is that people don't say things to him like, well, like the things um, he mentions here, like, I know an excellent colored man in my town, or I fought at Mechanicsville, right? That is in the Civil War. Um, or do not these Southern outrages make your blood boil, <laughs> right? So, so, so here we're talking about people who are um, um, who are trying not, at least trying not to be racist, right? Like they're trying to be nice to him. But it comes out in this weird way because there's this unasked question what does it feel like to be a problem? And they can't ask that question. So instead, they say, There was an excellent colored man in my town, or I fought at mechanics firm, or um, um, do not these southern outrages make your blood boil. Um, right? They're like, you know, there's, they're like, I'm an ally. <laughs> and, um, um, and what he, he says is that in Europe, he does not encounter that he's just like a sociologist from the United States, and that's, you know, <laughs> um, that's who they're talking to. So, um, so right, all this is by way of saying that, that, that this problem is, um, it's a, it's a problem about the like supposed universal extent of the principles that America has founded. That's what makes this a problem. Um,
Now, you know, um, you could, of course, take the attitude that um, the nation was never founded on principle. Right, that's that, that's like a um, mass delusion or propaganda or um, um, merely like super structural expression of what's really going on underneath or something like that. So, like um, sometimes Du Bois does. Down that way. So I'm going to read two things that are not in the assigned reading now. So one is from the passing of the firstborn, which is a um, like a very harrowing description of the death of his young son. Um, and I mean, not that it's not like he was killed by whites or something. He died of scarlet fever, I right? think. You know. It wasn't anyone, or I don't know, it was something like that. Anyway, one of those diseases that used to kill people in childhood. Um, so, uh, but um, but he does, as part of it, he does reflect that in some ways he's glad that his son died before he had to encounter the veil. <laughs> right, and that's that's like a painful thought for him. But anyway, um, uh, but so in that. Essay. This is on page 209 in your text. He says, um, he talks about, yeah, okay, actually, this is the very, within the veil he was born, said I, and there within shall he live. To a hope not, I'm skipping part, to a hope not hopeless, but unhopeful. And seeing with those bright wondering eyes that peer into my soul, a land whose freedom is to us a mockery and whose liberty a lie. Right? So that's, you know, so so that's a pretty that's that's saying like this, these underlying principles, at least to us, they're a lie. Right? They're not really there. But that's not the note that he mostly strikes in this book, or in Dark Water, for that matter. Even though, as we'll see, Dark Water is a, a darker, darker book. I'm not sure why it's called Dark Dark Water, but I guess I'll talk about that next time. Anyway, um, so here's something else. This is from the end of that essay on Booker T. Washington. Um, Not sure what page this is on in your text. Or wait, no, maybe maybe I did write that down. It's on page, I think it's a fifth, page 59 in your text. And I didn't write down where it was in mind. But it's the very end of the essay on Booker T. Washington. And he says, by every civilized and peaceful method, we must strive for the rights which the world accords to men clinging unwaveringly. So this, like, this is the end of his response to Booker T. Washington, right? He's saying, like, Booker T. Washington, you've done great stuff, but, you know, if you're gonna apologize for what's happening in the South and compromise it, whatever, it's our duty to resist you, right? And he says, by every civilized and peaceful method, we must strive for the rights which the world accords to men, clinging unwaveringly to those great words which the sons of the fathers would fain forget. Quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's the end of that thing. Right? So he's quoting Jefferson, slave owner, <laughs> right? Um, but he's still saying that um, that like those great principles that Jefferson laid down, um, the problem is that the sons of the fathers are trying to forget them. And we have to remind them. Um, so, I mean, so it's a little bit, I think, as I said, he hits that note more often, but I guess you would have to say, well, he's, he's kind of two minds of it. 
I think in the dark water, we'll say that see that also about Europe, but, um, but that's going to be a different explanation, I think. But so in this case, things like about about America, he's kind of he's kind of of two minds, right? Sometimes he thinks of it as the um, the great republic that's founded on these great principles, and um, and. Uh, part of the mission of American Blacks is to like remind the sons of the fathers of those great principles. But other times he thinks of it as um, yeah, a hypocritical society that claims to have these principles, but they really um, uh, from the beginning you know, we're not serious about that. And I guess, now, I mean, I wish we knew how to make this, I was gonna say, this is like a good segue, but I don't know how to completely fulfill the, the that I'm gonna build up by making it. <laughs> so, so like, so, so this is the segue. Of course, he's of two minds. So, like, right, probably the most famous um, idea from the souls of black folk is this idea of double consciousness. Um, that the pecu this peculiar sensation of being a problem is a kind of double consciousness. Sometimes he also calls it a second sight, which is more interesting than double consciousness. But, okay, so what is the double consciousness? So, like, At first, actually, it can seem like there's two different, completely different senses of double consciousness. And I think, um, um, well, when I first started thinking about this, I found that confusing. But these are, it's, it's, this is all on page three in your text. Um, Um, so it's actually right after the thing I read about the Negro as a sort of seventh son. And then it says, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels this two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled striving, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. So, um, as I said, there seem to be two different senses of double consciousness in, in, in that one sentence, <laughs> that one long sentence. Well, I guess it's more than one sentence. Anyway, in that one passage, there's two, seem to be two senses of double consciousness. One is that it's a kind of like doubled over consciousness, that it's, I don't know where to draw him now. He's talking about this, but that it's um, um, that I guess now you could say even when he's in this world, he's constantly seeing himself through the eyes of the other world. Um, Right, a world which yields him no true self consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. 
So that's a double consciousness in the sense that, like, that's a double consciousness in the sense that, um, I don't know, it's like, It's not that there's two consciousnesses. <laughs> there's one consciousness, but it's kind of double in the sense that it's like reflected on someone else. Um, but then at the end of that paragraph, there's this thing about the two-ness, both an American and a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, etc. So, I mean, I think the voice, however, thinks that these are the same, these are the same thing. And they're the same thing because like to achieve true self-consciousness would mean that I'm both like the measuring consciousness and the measured, right? Like both the conscious and the thing of which there is consciousness. That's true self-consciousness. That's true. The arrow goes back. Right, that's true self-consciousness. So um, what we have here, so like at first you can think of it like this, that the double consciousness is I see myself as this other person, an American sees me. But like the problem or the attempt to get out of this situation is to try to be this other person. Right, that is if you're gonna have to look at yourself from the point of view of this other person, then you want to identify with that other person. Um, so that's why um, um, this ends up being an internal double. The um, this is kind of a Hegelian thought, actually. Although I don't see a lot of traces of Hegelianism in his voice, so maybe that's a coincidence, but. You know, that like, um, um, this split, which at first is I see as a like, an, uh, um, kind of subjection to an alien consciousness. Um, in the attempt to deal with that, I, you know, I, what I, what I end up doing is trying to like, Bring the alien consciousness in to me. <laughs> um, so, um, so this uh, this situation, which it, which at first just looks like, oh, I'm stuck behind this veil. Oh no, turns out to actually mean that I'm self estranged. Um, I'm looking at myself through other eyes, and therefore, you know, I'm trying to make those eyes my own. And the goal is, and so this is important, but the goal, um, Du Bois says in this situation, so you might think the goal would be to forget about this and just see yourself in your own eyes and right and let you know have done with this. But um, again, I don't know, maybe I should say there is traces of Hegelianism here. I, but in any case, the that's not what he says the goal is in this situation. This is continuing uh, right after what I was reading before. So it's on page top of page four in your text. 
the history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. In this merging, he wishes neither of the older self to be lost. Right, so that this is an unsatisfactory situation, this self-alienation, it's strife, they can, you can barely hold it together, but right? it's like somehow try, literally like as if it's trying to tear your body apart. Um, but um, Du Bois is saying that, you know, um, the goal of this situation is um, Um, to achieve a new synthesis. And I feel bad about using that term because it's not really the right Hegelian term to use here, but in any case, but it, I mean, it's, it's good enough for quasi Hegelians, I guess. <laughs> right? To achieve a new synthesis, to be like, um, um, to have this doubleness, but like combined and at rest with itself. So now the reason I said, I don't know if I can pay the debt that I'm accumulating by making that segue is that, I mean, you, you, I should be able to go back and say, like, okay, so which, he's of two minds, which is the one that, you know, I mean, to oversimplify, which is the one that believes in America, in the principle of the great republic? Is it the ones within the veil or the ones without the veil? Um, and, or, you know, so there's, I guess there's three possible answers. It's the one within the veil, it's the one without the veil, and these are two disconnected things that I put each together. <laughs> but I mean, leaving the third possibility aside, like I think it's if you wanted to try to identify these the, these two dichotomies, so to speak, like the voices own um um double-mindedness about America and this double consciousness here, I think um, it would be tricky to say which way it goes. Um, I mean, you know, what? so one of the things he says, I think this is, again, is in the Dawn of Freedom, which I hear in the sign, but uh, then he says that like, there's never been a class that believed more deeply in the value of freedom than um, the slaves in the South. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, um, and that, you know, that, that one of the things that happened in the, at, at emancipation was that they felt like all their problems were solved. And it took them a while to wake up to the fact that they still had lots of problems. <laughs> right. So, um, um, so like, in some ways, uh, well, on the one hand, it's like, I guess maybe I should have started from the other side. The easy thing to be to say would be, well, the other world, like what Coates is going to call the dreamers, you know, the other world, you, you know, thinks that they're like. Um, floating in this universal space with these great principles and whatever, and doesn't realize like the, the, that um, that what they're really doing is um, um, like the way they got up there in space is by climbing on other people's back. <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, um, and that the, the the perspective from the black world is the one that would let you 
see through that. Um, but like I said, I think, so, I mean, I don't know, maybe we get the coach, I'll, I'll have to think about whether I think that's his final answer. But but for Du Bois, it seems it's not that simple. It sometimes at least seems like it's the other way around. Right? Like it's that these people are cynical. Um, they just all they care about now is dollars. They 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 want they're trying to forget these principles. Um and um so like when you you know when you say it's liberty, it's a lie. I mean, like. Um, in these people's mouths, it's a lot. <laughs> like, like in a more or less consciousness, right? Because again, if they don't believe that, you know, but, um, and, and the belief in the principles is here. <laughs> so I don't know, like I said, to begin with, I'm not sure that I'm really right to connect these two things or not. But I mean, it is striking that that like there's a question about okay, um, what how, does Du Bois take the Declaration of Independence at its word or not? And the answer is he seems to be of two minds about it. And then you find out that the, the, like, the big idea he introduced at the beginning of the book is double consciousness. Um, so, well, in any case, um, what, so like whether that part is right or not, I think like coming back to what I said about the double consciousness and the, and the attempt to overcome this situation. So like the book itself, and this maybe is another and maybe a deeper way to see in what sense this book is philosophical. The book itself is somehow an attempt to overcome this situation. What do I mean by that? Well, so like here's some of the um, examples he gives. He, he gives a whole series of examples of how this situation like makes it impossible for uh, various types of talented black individuals to succeed. And you know, he gives the example of an artisan, a minister, a doctor, an artist. And then here's another example it's on page five in your text. The would-be black savant was confronted, right? So like savant, I guess here is like a fancy word for intellectual, right? So the would-be black savant was confronted by the paradox that the knowledge his people needed was a twice told tale to his white neighbors. While the knowledge which would teach the white world was Greek to his own flesh and blood. Right, so that the problem here is that like the two-ness in this situation manifests itself in that the um, the, the would-be black savant has to decide who is my audience. Is it white people or black people? If it's going to be white people, then um, uh, well and. So again, this is this connects to the fact that at this stage he's he's definitely going to say that black people are behind. Right? They need education that the the white world already has. So um, so like what would be useful to them would be something that's like old hat to other people. But on the end, so 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 like then from you know from your point of view of like looking at yourself as 
through the eyes of the other world, you're going to say, well, no, I don't want to like, like, you know, popularize well-known things and like see them to people who aren't educated. I want to do my own new research and whatever, right? So then he says, well, but if you do that, then you'll find that people in your world don't understand what you're talking about. That's the dilemma. He also describes a similar dilemma for a, the Black artist. Um, which, I mean, Du Bois is definitely also an artist, right? So, um, but I think, um, but I think I, I, his, at this point, could just focus on that first one about the problem of the would be black savant. So, um, what's Du Bois's own reaction to this dilemma? What does he do? So, um, back to the beginning of the fourth thought. Gregory right, says this book is about the strange meaning of being black here in the dawning of the 20th century. And then he says, this meaning is not without interest to you, gentle reader. For the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. That, that's a line that he, he puts in the forethought and then in the um, Dawn of Freedom essay that occurs at the beginning and the end of the essay, right? So it's, like something he repeats, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color. Okay, so who is the gentle reader? Right, like what reader is he addressing there? Um, well, I think um, on the one hand, he sees himself as telling the, the white reader, the reader in the other world, something that is not a twice told tale from that, right? Something they do not know. Um, and um, something they need to hear. Right, so now this is from the other end of the book in the Sorrow Songs. Your text is on page 263. And he's talking about like why America needs the Negro people. Actively, we have woven ourselves with the very warp and woof of this nation. We fought their battles, shared their sorrow, mingled our blood with theirs, and generation after generation have pleaded with a headstrong, careless people to despise not justice, mercy, and truth, lest the nation be smitten with a curse. Right? So, like, one thing he's doing is expressing to the white reader something that is vital that they hear, vital for their own sake, right? It's not just like um, interesting information about um, like, oh, isn't it terrible that, you know, black people are going through or something, right? It's like uh, um, something they need to hear right away, lest they be smitten with a curse. <laughs> Um, um, right, and you know, uh, um, so in that sense, the gentle reader is the white reader, but like, meanwhile, there's also a message for the black reader, as we've already seen, and the message for the black reader is this thing about the world historical mission of the American black. Um, So, um, so 
So let me go back. This is a continuation of what I was reading before from our spiritual strivings. Um, In this merging, he wishes neither of the older selves to be lost. That's the last thing I read before. He would not Africanize America. For America has too much to teach the world and Africa. He would not bleach his Negro soul in a flood of white Americanism, for he knows that Negro blood has a message for the world. He simply makes wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American. Right, so I mean that could sound like a kind of report <laughs> on what the you know this is what the Negro wants, but I think it's um, especially as you can see from that Booker T. Washington essay, it's very much addressed to blacks. I mean, it means this is what you should want, right? Like you shouldn't want either to. Um, um, discard Americanism, because America has too much to teach Africa. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you shouldn't want to just become American like everyone else, because you have a mission. Um, you have your own mission. So, I mean, I would spend more time talking about this, but um, um, especially in the faith of the fathers, he says a lot of things about the temptations to which, he says also in our spiritual strivings, when he talks about how other um, people he knew reacted to coming to, to recognize the veil when they got older, right? But in the faith of our fathers, he says a lot about the temptations, like the temptation to either hypocrisy or radicalism. Um, that, and the, like, um, neither of those the right response for this situation. So again, I think they're, you know, he's, um, he's trying to warn his black readers against those alternatives. So, um, so the gentle leader is both, and in that way, he's trying to overcome this situation, right? He's telling them both something that they can understand and need to know. Um, and if he can do it, then he, you know. Um, to the extent that he can do it, he, become, he can become an example of what it is he's, he's saying that we need, right? Like a Negro who is also an American. Of course, again, this is where, like, the, when you remember that at the end of his life, he gave up on being an American, that has the, like, um, um, I don't know. Raise a worry about what's going on here. Seems that in the end he felt that it couldn't be done. But um, but at this stage he's saying that it's um, um, what were the words he used? Not hopeless, but worry. Unhopeful but not hopeless, something like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I think so. Um, that's what he's, he's doing here. And that's, um, and that's again how you can see how important, how like Central America is to this. Um, now, I mean, 
I was going to speculate about why he, why he says the gentle. I mean, it could be a it could be a pun on the meaning of gentle. But, it comes from the Latin word gens, right, which means like a people or a race. <laughs> um, I mean, and um, um, Du Bois taught Latin and Greek, among other things. <laughs> so he definitely could be thinking about something like that. Um, uh, on the other hand, there's also like at the very end of the book, there's like a hidden meaning is suddenly revealed, right? Because in the afterthought, um, he says, hear my cry, O God, the reader, vouchsafe that this my book fall not stillborn into the world wilderness. Let their spring, gentle one, capitalize gentle, right? So at the end, it turns out that the, the, the gentle reader was God. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know exactly how to put that together with this. Um, um, but, oh no, I don't have any more time to say anything. So, But yeah, I think I said what was important. Okay, so I will see you on Thursday.